Good morning, Palm Valley. Let's try that again. This is the early service. Good morning. It's good to see you all here. You had your coffee. You're awake. We're ready to go. We're going to be finishing off the X Factor series today. We've been talking about the X Factor faith and how when you put your faith in God and when you act on that faith, just amazing things can happen in your life. God just works in powerful ways. But today we're going to be talking about doubt. When you have doubt. Now what you're going to find is that, you know how kryptonite is to Superman, right? Kryptonite just takes away all his powers. In the same way as kryptonite is to Superman, doubt is to faith. It just has a way of neutralizing faith. Now, when, I was, my, when my kids were small, I used to play games with them that just kind of taught me lessons on faith. We had like a high dresser here, and when my kids were little, what I would do is I would put them up on the dresser, and I and just playing a game with them. Don't try this at home, okay? I'd put them up on the dresser, and I'd say, face that way. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to fall backwards, and I'm going to catch you. Just right into my arms. It's going to catch you. I was kind of seeing if they trusted me. And so my older daughter, Maria, she would go up there and she'd look back, are you sure, Dad? Yeah, and then she would giggle, and then she would fall back into my arms, maybe react a little just before she, you know, hit my arms. And then my son, my younger son, he wasn't as trusting. And I would put him up there, and uh, he would say, Dad, are you sure, are you sure? And he would kind of, you know, try to do this. I said, no, stand up and just fall backwards into my arms. And so he would actually do this. He would, he would fall backwards, and in midair, he would turn his body around <laughs> and throw his arms around my neck and, you know, clamp his legs around me because he didn't trust me. Now, for my kids to fall back into my arms, to fully trust me, they had to believe two things. First of all, they had to believe that I love them, that I wasn't going to mess around with them. You know, I wasn't one of those cruel dads say, come on, yeah, you learned that lesson. You know, it's good for life. You got to toughen you up. No, I, I, was, I wasn't a cruel dad. I, I was a loving father. So they had to trust my love. They also had to trust my ability to catch them. They had to trust my strength. Because, you know, they said, Dad, you know, what if you drop me? You know, what, what if you're too weak? They had to believe that I was strong enough to hold them. And that's the, the way it is with God, too. If you want to trust God or when you go through seasons of doubt and things start to get hard, we start to say, well, gosh, God, I'm not sure you, you really love me. Or, you know, Lord, I'm not sure you have the ability to get me out of this. Well, there's another way to distrust God, not just his love and his ability, but sometimes we distrust his plan. This hit hard, really, uh, this, this past summer when I heard about a, a pastor friend who committed suicide in Hawaii. Um, I had known him as a young youth pastor when he was 19 years old. Um, he had actually spoken to... Um, the youth group in my church and the kids had come away saying this guy is fantastic he's authentic you know he preaches from the word he's worshipful he loves God I mean he he was just an aspiring Christian leader and was going to be you know I, I thought he's going to be an awesome pastor this kid make a difference in the world what happened was he fell in love with a gal and they got married and began a wonderful ministry together and then about six years into that, they were hiking in Hawaii, and they were on a 75-foot high waterfall. And we don't know how it happened, but she slipped, and she fell off the waterfall. And he dove in right after her, 75 feet, folks. He sustained some injuries, and she did as well. Um, but in the process of recovering, she died. She died. And he not only lost his wife, but he lost his faith. He just went. Um, before committing suicide, he actually put up a, a video, and I got to see it. And he just describes his process, and it's just so sad. Because you see this kid that was so vibrant, so full of faith, just saying, I'm not sure where she is, I just want to go to her. And he was just so broken down in grief. His faith just, boom, just disappeared. You know what that told me was, man, when it comes to doubts, man, if you don't deal with your doubts, well, if you don't deal with your doubts right, they can just take you to despair and, and just to a dangerous place in life and make bad decisions. Well, today we're going to learn from Scripture, from Christ, how to deal with our doubts and how He can strengthen us and take us through those seasons of doubt. In your notes, you have Matthew 14 printed there for you. If you have a Bible, you can follow along in Matthew 14. Let me tell you what's going on. Jesus in Matthew 14 is doing His ministry along the countryside, uh, a big crowd of people have gathered. He's healed a bunch of people. Uh, there are like 5,000 men, the Bible says. That means there are about 10,000 people, because it, plus the women and children. 
And his disciples say, you know what, it's kind of, you know, out here, it, there aren't too many markets around. Send them away so they can get something to eat. And then Jesus said, no, you feed them. I said, Jesus, we have like five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, sit them down. Can you imagine that? Sit them down. 10,000 people. Sit them down and we're going to feed them. And so he took the bread and the fish and he multiplied it miraculously and they fed 10,000 people and they collected 12 baskets full, more than they started with. The disciples are there, the people are there, it's an exciting ministry. And then we come to verse 22 there in your notes. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So Jesus sends his disciples on ahead of him. He dismisses an excited crowd, spends some alone time with his father. And then by this time, they're, they're quite a distance from land, and they're starting to strain at the oars because there's a storm whipping up on the, on the lake. Verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, that's about 3 a.m. in the morning, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. And you can't blame them, folks. I mean, you're sitting there, it's in the dead of night, you're trying to, you know, straining, there's a storm, you see a figure walking on water. Humans can't walk on water. And so they figure, it's got to be a ghost, and they, they scream out. Verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Jesus sees their fear and just says, calm down, guys, it's me. <laughs> and then one of them just takes it a step further. Verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. You got to love Peter. You know, once Jesus identifies himself, you know, I mean, the mouths drop open, the eyes pop out, you know, they go, oh my God, this is Jesus walking on the water. And then Peter takes it a step further. Now, Peter was the disciple that had no filter between his eyes and ears and his mouth. You know, he would hear or see something and then just speak what he was feeling, just speak it out. And, you know, he, had, he was a fisherman. He had made, uh, like, his living on the lake. He had been in a boat many times over the water. And so for him to see Jesus walking on the water like he was taking a stroll, it just impacted him. And he says, I want to do that. I, I want to do that. And so he immediately says, Jesus, if it's you, you know, call me to come out to you. And the disciples roll their eyes at him. And I imagine Jesus kind of smiles a little bit and extends his hand. And look at what, verse 29. Come, he said. Come. Then Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and came towards Jesus. Folks, imagine what that looked like. I mean, Peter took a leg and threw it over the side of the boat. He reached his toe down toward the water, and then he put his weight on it, and it held. And then he lit, got his other leg out of the boat, and he reached down and put his weight on it, and that held. And then he let go of the side of the boat, and he turned, and he began to walk on water towards Christ. Now I imagine that Peter had that terrified look on his face, and a terrified joy. You know what I'm talking about? Like, have you ever taken a picture, like, going down the roller coaster, and you're, like, laughing and screaming at the same time? You know, I, I just, yeah, I just had this terrified, like, oh, my, well, you know, look at what I'm doing. And he's just walking towards Jesus. But the, the uh, wind was still blowing, and the waves were still rough. Look at the next verse. But when, the, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. It might have been a stinging splash in his, you know, in his eyes of water. It may have been the wind almost you know, blowing him over, a gust of wind. In any case, Peter's faith falters. And the deep, dark waters start to swallow him up. He starts to go down. And he just cries out. He cries out to Jesus. Look at verse 31. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. We don't know if he dragged him to the boat or walked him back to the boat. But once he's in the boat, Jesus gives a silent command. Waves go flat, wind stops. Boom, the storm's over. You know, I imagine it's quiet. All you can hear is Peter just kind of coughing, you know, up water. The other disciples standing back in shock. And then all of a sudden, like a ton of bricks, it hits them. They realize 
who it is that just stepped into their boat and they do what anybody in their right mind would do. Look at verse 33. Then those who were in the boat, what? Worshipped him. They worshipped him saying, truly you are the son of God. And what do we learn from the story about doubts? Number one, you can write this in your notes. Jesus invites us to the miraculous edge. The X factor gets us there. In verse 29, you see that verse, it says, Come, he said, then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. We see two things here. First of all, Peter walked on the water. There was something about his spontaneous, outrageous reaction to Jesus that was right. He was trusting Jesus to do something that was beyond his ability and, and God empowered. He participated in a miracle. The other thing that we see here is Jesus' invitation to come. Now, Peter instinctively knew that he couldn't walk on the water by himself, but if Jesus called him, that was different. Now, when Jesus said, if it's you, call me, Peter could have said, Peter, what am I, what am I gonna do with you? What am I gonna do with you? Now, let me help you understand something. Son of God, Fisherman, miraculous, walk on water, you sit back and marvel. That's how it works. But Jesus didn't do that at all. Jesus did hear what he did throughout his ministry. He invited his followers to participate with him on the miraculous edge, to do something that they couldn't do without God's help. You know what, what that means for us every single day, folks, is that God invites us to a genuine God-empowered life change. That is, God wants to, with his power, forgive all of our sins. He wants to heal our past. He wants to help us overcome our failures. He wants to lead us on a journey that's filled with meaning and love and, and, and joy. God-empowered life change. It also means that God wants to partner with you in such a way that when you bow your knees and you lift your, your voice to heaven in prayer, that those prayers are powerful. They're powerful. Do you notice in the story that between walking on the water, I mean, uh, before he walks on the water, after he feeds the 5,000, or in between there, there's a time of just quiet communion with God. Jesus just gets away with the Father and spends time alone with him in prayer. He did that a lot. And then he told his disciples, now it's really important that you pray persistently and that you ask God for big things. You ask him for big things. It means your prayers would be powerful. It also would mean sending you into the world with God at your side so that you don't have to endure it, you don't have to survive it, folks, that you can change it. God wants to use your life in a powerful way to change the people around you, to change your workplace, to change your neighborhood, to change your family. There's so many that think that being a good Christian is for people that are wired to be religious. You, you, you know what I mean? Like it, it's all about establishing uh, like a life of good religious habits. And, and you become a good person because you're, you're so religious. But that's not it. That's not what Jesus teaches. That would be human-empowered religion, folks, and people leave those religions. When you come to a place where you truly trust Jesus Christ, you begin a dynamic moment-by-moment -moment relationship with him. And he wants to get you on the miraculous edge where God-empowered things are happening in and through your life. The second thing we learn from the story is that life storms can carry us into seasons of doubt. The X factor falters. Notice verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. In the story, Peter had enough faith to walk on the water. He had enough faith to walk on the water but he didn't have enough faith to endure the storm. Now, when Peter said, call me to come to you, Jesus, again, had an option. Jesus could have said, hang on, Peter. Okay, be still. Boom. Okay, now let's try it. Could have done that. But Jesus didn't do that at all. He called Peter to trust him in the midst of the storm. Trust him in the midst of the storm. Isn't it easy to follow Jesus when everything's going well? Finances are great, everybody's healthy, everything's going well. Isn't it easy to follow Jesus when everything's going well? But when the storms come, that's when, like kryptonite is thrown in your path. And doubt starts to build. We start to doubt God's power. 
We start to doubt God's love. We start to doubt God's plan. God, you, you got something wrong here. What's your storm this morning? You know, your storm might be financial. Maybe you, you lost a job. Maybe you lost your home or you're losing it. Maybe you sent in 50 applications and you still no callbacks. Maybe you're watching your savings disappear or, or maybe you've gone through the experience of walking into Walmart with your last 20 bucks. You said, this has to last the week. This has to last the week. Maybe your storm is medical. More bad news. Something showed up on a test or maybe there's a new symptom that appeared and you Google it and it sounds bad. No healing. God, what's going on? Maybe your storm is relational. You have a frustrating family situation that, that is so bad that you dread walking through your own front door. Or maybe you have just nights filled with worry for that prodigal family member, that father, that mother, you know, that son or daughter, that uncle, somebody in your family who is out there struggling and making more and more bad decisions that are just destroying their life. You just worry. Lord, when are you going to change them? When are you going to show up for them? Maybe your storm is personal failure. Maybe you've lost a lot because of your own choices. Habitual sin, is, is, it takes you down again and again, and it's just eroding your relationships. And try as you may, you feel like a failure. Jesus, where's the life change? Where's your power? What's your storm? My friend lost his wife. He lost his wife, and his faith just began to erode. If you're in the middle of a storm or you find yourself sinking, you may be thinking, well, why doesn't Jesus just calm the storm? And Peter will be the first to say, yeah, he doesn't do that all the time. Yeah, Jesus doesn't do that all the time. But he does invite you to trust him in the midst of your storm. He does. And that takes us to point three. Jesus will keep your faith growing to the end. The X factor renewed and growing. Verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And by the way, did you notice in the story, Peter's going down. So, you know, you figure he's about down to here. And he's just reaching out to Jesus. And Jesus grabs him and he corrects him right there. He, he doesn't take him to the boat first. He goes, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, if you're Peter, say, can you just kind of, you know, <laughs> it's embarrassing enough. You know, he just corrects him right there, lovingly, gets him into the boat. But you know what? Peter did something that was really wise here. He really did. Something that I wish my friend had, had come to. Peter didn't cry out, God, I knew you didn't care for me as he's going down. I knew you didn't have the strength to let me walk on water. That's it, I'm not following you anymore. He didn't do that. He said three very wise words. Lord, what? Save me. Lord, Lord, save me. What's exciting about being in a relationship with Jesus is that it truly is a relationship. Both sides. You love him and he loves you. You follow him and he leads. If you want to know how he feels about his side of the relationship, in John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29, Jesus says this, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. What does that tell you about his commitment to you? He will keep your faith to the end. He will make sure of it. In times when your faith fails, he can and will step in and renew and strengthen it. He did that for Peter again and again. He took this fumbling, outspoken fisherman, and he patiently taught him and grew him. Before Jesus went to the cross, you know, he, he went up to Peter. He says, now Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. He's going to take you down. But Peter, 
when you get back up, strengthen your brothers. And Peter says, I'm willing to die for you. I'm not going to go down. <laughs> and then, you know, same, he has that, that no filter. And, and Jesus said to him, Peter, before the morning comes, you're going to deny me three times. His worst failure. You're going to deny me three times, but when you get back on your feet, strengthen your brothers. I, I love that because he said, you know what? You're going to go down, but you're not going to stay down. You're not going to stay down. He not only restored Peter's faith, but he made him the leader of the early Christian church that changed the world. It changed the world. The leader, this guy with the big mouth. Because he patiently grew and renewed and strengthened his faith. And it's the same for us. We may go through seasons of doubt, throw up our hands in the midst of storms, but Jesus will ever, always, always be there for us, making sure that when we go down, he'll lift us up again and keep us on our journey. He'll be faithful to you. Now, in the last part of the story, in the very ending, we learn how to respond to doubt. You can write this in your notes. Remember who Jesus truly is. Remember who Jesus truly is. Notice in verse 33, it says, Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The climax of the story is the realization of who, who Jesus Christ was, that Jesus Christ truly is God's Son. In the book of Matthew, it's the first time the disciples give him that title because they have a growing understanding of just how great and powerful Jesus is. And then they do something very profound here at the end. They worship him. Now, folks, in the Bible, it's very clear. Nobody but nobody receives legitimate worship except who? God. Only God. Angels would come in the Bible and, you know, deliver messages, and, you know, the humans would fall down and start worshiping them. They go, no, 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 I'm just a servant of God. Only God receives worship. There were the apostles in the book of Acts that were doing great miracles in Jesus' name, and people would fall down and start worshiping them. They would say, no, 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 get up. No, only God receives worship. We're just men. But here we see Jesus receiving worship. In the Christmas story, which is coming up, and I'm all excited about that, you know, when, when in the Christmas story, the Magi, they worship the baby Jesus. When Jesus heals the, blind, the man born blind in the temple, after that healing, the man goes down and he worships Jesus, and Jesus receives that worship. Why? Because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. The Bible tells us that there's only one true God and that he exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it was God the Son who clothed himself with human flesh and came to earth on a mission to save mankind. And he did the things that only God could do. I mean, Jesus demonstrated power over disease and demons. He forgave sins, which only God can do. He controlled the weather. He turned water into wine. He fed 5,000 people with a couple of baskets of food. He raised people from the dead, and he overcame death himself. And he walked on the water, just to name a few. What does it mean to us that Jesus is God? Well, it means three things. First of all, his love is unshakable. His love is unshakable. In Romans 8, 38, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you notice how he kind of covers, like, everything? <laughs> you know, it's like, I, here and here and here and here. And he says, what is he saying is, nothing can separate you from the love of God. His love is unshakable. You can trust his love for you, no matter how bad the storm you're in. The second thing we can know about Jesus, because he's God, is his power is immeasurable. Not only did he do miracles on earth to show who he was, but the Bible tells us that he participated with the Father in creation. That Jesus Christ was there and exercised his power to create everything there is in the universe. And by the exercise of his power, moment by moment, he sustains the universe. His power, folks, is immeasurable. 
He has all the power of God at his disposal, and he is able to get you through the storm, whatever it is. His power is greater than your problems will ever be. The third thing we learn about him is that his plan for you is perfect. It's perfect. He promises to complete you. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, it says this. Would you read that with me? It's on the screen. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He will perfect it until the, until the day of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is personally committed to finishing you, to growing your faith, to developing you into the person God wants you to be. Now, he never promises that there will be no storms in your life, but he does invite you to trust him in the midst of those storms. And his plan is to complete you because he loves you and he has the power to get you through the storm. Now, once you realize who he is, you take the next step and you involve him in all your life. There's another word for that, by the way. You know what the word is? Involving him in all your life? Worship. It's worship. See, worship isn't just coming, although this is an important part of it, and singing songs and lifting up our, our hearts and voices to God. Worship is living out a life that honors him in every way. How do you do that? Well, first of all, get together with him every day. Take the Bible and open it up and sit at the feet of Jesus and let him speak to you. And then say, Jesus, help me live this out today. We're not talking about like a religious habit that religious people do. We're talking about a relationship with Jesus. He wants to speak into your life every day. So open your Bible. Read your Bible and say, Lord Jesus, speak to me today. Teach me a little bit more about faith. Bring him to the center of your marriage your family, your neighborhood, your workplace, wherever your storm may be, to say, Jesus, come into my marriage. Help me to honor you as a husband. Help me to honor you as a wife. Lord, the parenting thing is it's just bringing us into a storm. Lord Jesus, I want to invite you to the center of that storm with us. And I want to trust you that, to lead us through this. Now, I want you to know that every single week across the west side, in homes all over the place, we have these groups called small group Bible studies. And you know what they are? They're groups of regular people that are together bringing Jesus to the center of their lives and just hammering it out together, sharing with each other, praying, getting into the Word together. They have trained leaders that we make sure are trained to, to help you understand who Jesus is. And I just encourage you, join a small group Bible study. Um, it, it, it is one of the best places just to, to learn and grow and to see life change. Outside in the lobby, there's some glass doors, and there's a place in there called Connecting Point. And uh, you can walk in there. There are people there that can answer questions and show you where the small groups are, or you can get online, and you can sign up there. But you want to involve them in all your life. You want to live a life of worship to Jesus Christ. And the best way to do that is just to involve them in everything you do. What do you do today? Well, you need to write something there in that space in your bulletin, what to do today. Because I think this story tells us that Jesus is committed to building our faith through seasons of doubt. He's committed to it. He'll build our faith through seasons of doubt. But first of all, you may be a person who needs to take their first step of faith. Maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's important for you to know that Jesus didn't come to just do like tricks and show us how powerful God is by doing fancy miracles. The greatest miracle that Jesus did was, it was part of his mission. Jesus Christ came to earth and he went to the cross. And God in a supernatural way took your sins and my sins, the things that separate us from God. And Jesus died on the cross paying the penalty on our behalf so that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God forgives you completely, all your sins. And he establishes a relationship with you and he places his Holy Spirit in you. And you get to walk with God in a powerful way. That's the X factor thing. You trust Christ and you begin that relationship. And some of you just need to write yes in that spot. Yes, I need to follow Jesus. There's another group of you here that you're in the middle of a storm. And you're wondering, gosh, did I take a wrong turn? You're in the middle of a storm, financial, relational. 
I just want you to know, and you can write this in, hold on, hold on. You're where you need to be. You say, I thought because of the storm I was in the wrong place. No, you may be exactly where God wants you. As long as you're keeping Christ in the center, you're obeying God and you're doing the things that he wants you to do, and you say, but things are getting so hard, just hold on. You're right where you need to be. Just ask Christ for the power and the strength just to continue on and to trust him. There's a third group of you, and you're the ones that are in the water. And some of you say, hey, I'm not just like halfway here. I've been there for a long time. Truth is, didn't even want to come to church. And you say, you know, I just, I was driving by or somebody kept inviting me. I thought I'd shut them up by coming, you know. Well, the truth is God wanted you here today. And you may say, I'm just too far gone. I'm just too far from the surface. You are never too far away where the love and the power of Christ can't reach you. You are never too far away. And what you need to write there is those three wise words. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. I know what it feels like to be there. I do. I've gone through my own storms. Could have checked the list at one time in my life, every one of them. And I tell you, Jesus' hand will firmly wrap around you and pull you out and get you back on your feet and keep you moving forward. Don't give up. Lord, save me. Don't give up. Come back. The fourth group of people out there need to write this. Get out of the boat. Folks, in the story, there's one place to be. Now, obviously, we don't want to be in the water struggling, although we will end up there sometime. And we don't want to be sitting in the boat. We need to be on the miraculous edge with Jesus Christ. And the truth is, statistics tell us that 60% of churches, they sit in the boat and they cheer. All right, yeah, let's do some miraculous things. But you know what? If you really want to experience all that God has for you, you have got to get out of the boat. And you've got to get all into the water on the miraculous edge where God is doing extraordinary things through ordinary people. You know, we have a group that just came back from Haiti, and I said, hey, how was the trip? Amazing. You just talk to them. Get out of the boat. What do I mean? Just get involved. Get into the fight. You know, on October 30th, we have a membership class. And, you know, in our membership class, we don't say, we're going to teach you how to be religious. We don't do that. You know, what we do is we say, you know, we want to help you to become a member of our family, of our army, and we are going to climb over the side of the boat together. We're going to get you on that miraculous edge. We're going to equip you to be there. And because Palm Valley Church, we don't sit in the boat. We're, we're just not like that. We, we don't. We, we want to be out there in the water trusting Christ for big things. That's why we're doing the multi-site. And in a few minutes, you're going to hear about exactly where that is. And you know what? Some of you are going to have to get out of the boat, out of being, uh, from being comfortable, and go out there and do something powerful for God. Doubt is like kryptonite to faith. But Jesus Christ is committed to building my faith through seasons of doubt. Let's stand together and let's pray. And let's ask him to, to build us up. Can we? Let's bow our heads together. You know, if you're here this morning and you've never taken the hand of Christ or put your faith in him, and you realize just how powerful and, and, and how loving he is and how much he wants you, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to begin a relationship with God. In the quietness of your own, your own heart, just have a sincere conversation with God and just tell him this. God, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm ready to change. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead to give me eternal life. I now invite Jesus Christ to forgive me and to come into my life and to lead me from now on. And it's in his name I pray. And everybody said,